the winning, winning, winning blueprint, blueprint presents. presents. <laughs> So we arrived at what I deemed my upset special of the week. I don't give these out often because you can't go out on the limb too often in the National Football League. It'll come back to bite you. But this one I felt confident about because I said, the Atlanta Falcons, who are 8-0 at the time and traveling to the Superdome to take on the New Orleans Saints, a 3-5 and football team, I said, look, someone's going to clip these Falcons soon. Because you can't keep dodging bullets. You can't keep dodging. Shoo, 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 shoo. You can't keep ducking and dodging bullets. They're coming at you too fast and too furious. You can't keep ducking them. Someone's going to get you. And if you're the Falcon, someone's going to clip one of those Falcon wings. Someone's going to clip it. And it's going to be someone in your own family. It's always someone in your family. You don't expect it from someone in your family. But it's always someone in your family. They smile in your face, but all the time, they want to take your place. That's right. Those family members, them some backstabbers. They're going to get you every time. And I said, it's going to be someone in their division, someone conducting family business. Because as we all know, anything goes when you're talking about family. And so I said, I don't know if it's going to be Tampa Bay. Don't know if it's going to be Carolina. Don't know if it's going to be New Orleans. I don't know who it's going to be, but it's going to be someone in that division. It's going to be Someone conducting some family business. Someone's going to stab them in the back. And wouldn't you know it? I said, look, this is a prime opportunity. The Falcons, they struggle in the Superdome. Every year, it's a battle. Even if they come out with a victory, it's a hard-fought one. They always struggle, no matter what the circumstances are. And normally, the Saints are a good team. So you can't say even when the Saints are bad, because normally, they're a good football team. But in this season, where they have their struggles, and they haven't been playing the best of defense, and the offense hasn't always been that sharp. You knew that the Saints were going to show up for this Falcons team. If it's if, if there's one team in the National Football League that the Saints at home want to beat, it's the Atlanta Falcons. That that fan base was going to get up for this. Drew Brees and that offense was going to get up for this, and that defense was going to get up for this. And I will say this: you make fun of the Saints. I've made plenty of fun of the Saints this season since Joe Vitt has come back. He's instilled a calm over this team. And it's been a very subtle calm. It hasn't been anything extreme. The defense is all of a sudden playing just a little bit better. The offense is starting to get in a groove. And all of a sudden now, the Saints team is starting to look a wee bit dangerous. Not saying that they're coming back to get a playoff spot because I think that ship is sailed. I think they took too long to make their move in the NFC this year. However, they're playing some scary football. And if they get hot enough, they get hot enough. I don't know. I don't know. Just I'm just saying. I, I don't know. I'm just saying. However, I saw this one coming. That's why I said this was my upset special. Because I said, they're going to give it everything they got in this game. And the Falcons have been cutting it close. And, and eventually, someone's going to get you. You're not going to get away every time. If it's one team who's at home that the Falcons have to go on the road to that have a shot, it's the Saints. And so they came into this game. Drew Brees was flawless in this game. I mean, he was really doing what we've come to know and love from Drew Brees, which is be cerebral, be pinpoint accurate, have guys running down the field and hit them in stride and allow them to score. Jimmy Graham was Jimmy Graham in this game. This is the Jimmy Graham from last year. Not this year's Jimmy Graham. Last year's Jimmy Graham. Jimmy Graham last year, that was the best tight end on the National Football League. And yes, Gronk had an excellent season. Jimmy Graham, to me, was better than Gronk last year. And he showed it against the Falcons in this game. This was a tight end duel. I mean, Tony Gonzalez was playing some good football in this game. I mean, the pass that uh, Matt Ryan threw to him, the thread the needle in the end zone was an excellent catch, an excellent throw. And this was a back and forth matchup. It's exactly what I thought it was going to be. I knew it was going to be close. I knew it was going to go down to the wire. I knew it was going to be 
someone's defense stepping up. And I didn't know that the Saints had it in them. I thought that they played some really good defense in this game. And yeah, they still gave up 20-something points, 27 points. Doesn't matter. When they needed to get the stop, they got it. You know, the Falcons got down there late in the ball game, went for it on fourth down. Critical stop. Jabari Greer lays out, sells out, smacks the ball down. Beautiful stop. Okay? You know, and, and what good teams do is in that situation is they say, hey, look, we didn't get seven. We're going for it. We don't get it. Stop them. Stop them. They're going to punt to us. And then we'll get the ball back and we'll go right back down there and we'll get points. Don't worry about it. So that's what they did. They stopped the Saints, forced them to punt. And to his credit, Morstead, the punter, man, did he put a charge into that one from his own end zone. Really backed the Falcons up. Then they got a holding penalty on top of it to really put them in a tough situation. Tried to go down the field. They couldn't do it. The Saints defense rose to the occasion. And the Saints got it done at home against the Atlanta Falcons in a hard-fought ball game. And I tell you what, I've been clamoring for the Saints to give Chris Ivory some run. Let the man run the football. He's one of the best backs you have. You know, I'm not just saying this for my health. He's an asset, whether you put him on the field or you trade him. He's an asset for you. Use him. What do you do? You put him in. What does Chris Ivory do for the second consecutive week? Long touchdown run. This one was a beauty. Sliced in between two Falcon defenders. Jumped inside. Cut on them. Stiff arm a Falcons defensive back. En route to a long touchdown run. It's Chris Ivory. Give him a shot, man. Give Chris Ivory the football. And they did in this game. To a certain extent, it paid dividends, and they got it done 31-27 to in this ballgame, sending the Falcons to their first defeat of the season. Now the Falcons are 8-1. and one. And look, for the Falcons, this might be the best thing that could have happened to them because a lot of times when you're undefeated and you're the last undefeated team, there's a lot of pressure on you. Every week it starts to mount more and more. Everyone wants to know, can you do it? Are you the, the 72 Dolphins and yada, yada, yada? You don't want that extra added pressure. If you're the Falcons, you're not even a good postseason team right now. You don't need any extra pressure going into the postseason. You just want to win games, get home field advantage in the NFC, get a bye week, and come out and play good football at home instead of coming off your bye in the playoffs and getting absolutely massacred like you did about two or three seasons ago to the Packers who went on to win that Super Bowl. Or even last year, where you were just utterly dominated by the New York Giants in New York. You just want to get home field advantage. Make teams come to the Georgia Dome. And Matt Ryan said it best. We're going to define what that loss means. Are we a team that's going to hang our heads in defeat? Or are we going to pick ourselves up and say, all right, we lost our first game of the season. We don't like the way that feels. Let's not feel that again. Let's start winning ball games again. We're going to see. I think this is a good Atlanta Falcons team. I just thought that they ran into a team that was better than them on this day in the New Orleans Saints, who are now 4-5 and five on the season. Moving right along. The New York Jets traveled to Seattle to take on the Seattle Seahawks. And <laughs> another one of these games where you knew it was going to be a physical matchup. You thought it was going to be close. The Jets are coming off of a bye. You're thinking, okay, they had two weeks to prepare for the Seahawks team. Still didn't think it was going to be enough, but you said, hey, two weeks, you're getting healthy, guys are coming back fresh off of a bye, two weeks to prepare for a rookie quarterback. Rex Ryan is going to do everything in his power to confuse this rookie quarterback, make him make plays, and try to force turnovers. First thing you have to do if you're playing the Seattle Seahawks is stop the run. If you allow Marshawn Lynch to control the tempo of the game, then you can't get a hold of this Seattle Seahawks offense because they're going to play action fake off that run. And Russell Wilson throws the best deep ball in all of the National Football League. And he's very sound in whatever they ask him to do because that running game is so sound. You have to respect the running game. So now he has time to pass. You can't bend your ears back because you have to worry about Marshawn Lynch in that running game. And like I said, of all the rookies in the National Football League that are in the starting five, feel like he's being handled the best. But not everyone is afforded a great defense and an even better running game. Not everybody has that at their disposal. And so while his situation, that being Russell Wilson, is most ideal for a rookie quarterback, 
everyone isn't afforded that opportunity. You usually come in as a rookie to a bad football team. Your franchise is looking for you to be the answer. And so it's not a good team as constructed when you show up as the Seattle Seahawks already were. There were, there were pieces in place. They weren't always a good team, but the pieces were in place. The ball was set in motion, and guys are starting to get it. The light bulb is starting to come on for guys. And you could see it happening last year, and now it's starting to happen even more so this year. And Russell Wilson and this Seattle Seahawks offense is getting better by the weeks. And this defense, we already know that this defense is good. What was disappointing in this game is the Jets had a bye, had two weeks to prepare, and they came out and looked like a team that that didn't have a clue. Uh, they just looked like an outmatched football team in this game. Mark Sanchez, look, I'm all four players in the locker room having the back of their starting quarterback. But at some point, you have to wonder, when are the Jets going to realize that he isn't who you thought he was. He isn't the guy that you traded up to get. He's not the guy that's going to take you where you want to go. And at some point, the Jets have to suffer concussion-like symptoms. They have to see the blood trickling from their head and have to realize, all right, we're, we're tired of banging our head against this brick wall. We have concussion-like symptoms. We're bleeding. How about we just make a change and stop banging our head against this brick wall? No, they seem to like the way that feels. And so they're going to keep going in the same direction that has them 3-6 and six on the season. I don't understand the logic there because Sanchez had another lackluster performance. And yeah, you can blame it on several different factors. This defense hasn't been any good this season. They have a running game that is non-existent at times. Don't care about any of that because if you're the quarterback, you find a way to get it done. And Mark Sanchez repeatedly doesn't do that. And no, he doesn't have the best weapons at his disposal, but he has enough. I know of more teams in the league who have less than the Jets have and who are doing more with what they have. So I don't want to hear that as an excuse either. You don't have talent? That's what Tony Sperano is for. I saw Tony Sperano squeeze a bucket of water out of a dry rag. I've seen him do it before. So I don't want to hear about you don't have talent. I've seen... Tony Sperano be talentless and get his team 10 wins, 11 wins, and win a division. So I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear you don't have talent. All I want you to admit to me is that Mark Sanchez is not the answer. That's all I want. I know you're not a good football team. I see that. Rex Ryan is starting to wear thin on a lot of these guys. That message isn't getting through. I think he might have ran his course in New York. I'm just saying. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Don't know if he needs to go or not. I'm not sure. Because I think the man can coach defense. I just don't think he has any horses on defense right now. You know, that, that linebacker corpse getting old. You're not getting any pressure. You don't have any, any guys that can pin their ears back, go after the quarterback. This isn't the same aggressive defense that we saw when Rex Ryan first took over this Jets team. That could blitz like crazy, man up on the outsides, play man to man, and say, all right, I'm blitzing seven, I'm blitzing eight. What are you going to do? Can you stand up to that kind of heat? Because I don't think you can. He can't do that anymore. He doesn't have guys that can get there. He doesn't have Darrell Reeves, so he can't cover one-on-one, man-to-man on the outside. He can't do the things that he likes to do. And so I don't know what the exact answer is, but i tell you one thing that is not the answer, and that's Mark Sanchez. And he went in, laid another egg. That running game laid another egg. That coaching staff laid another egg. And the Jets, as a whole, laid another egg on Sunday against the Seattle Seahawks. They lose. 28-7. to seven. And they even let the Seahawks have a little fun, pull out a little razzle-dazzle on them for a touchdown. That's what happens when you're not a good football team. Teams start trying stuff on you, and most times it works. And that's what happened against the Jets in this football game. As they drop another one, they go to 3-6 and six on the season. And this thing is going downhill fast. And I don't know. Heads might have to roll at the end of the season. We don't know. We'll see. But they're 3-6 and six on the season. Meanwhile, shh. Very, very quietly, this Seattle Seahawks team, 6-4 and four on the season, rookie quarterback, Pete Carroll, has his team believing that they are a good football team. And if you have to play them at home, I feel bad for you because this team does not lose at home. They play at a different level at home. You get them on the road, and you don't know what Seattle Seahawks team you get. You get them at CenturyLink Field, you are in some trouble. 
And uh, the Jets found that out on Sunday, 28 to 7. Seahawks get it done. They're now 6 and 4. Jets are 3 and 6. Two teams going in direct opposite directions. In what was the perceived marquee matchup of the day? And like I said on the Friday show, this is what everyone was going to be watching and tuning in for this week. And I said I thought that the Saints game was going to ultimately be the best game of the weekend. And I think I feel pretty confident in saying that uh, then and, and now after seeing what transpired over the weekend. But nonetheless, this was a marquee matchup going into the weekend. And that was the Dallas Cowboys with their 3-5 and five record traveling to Philadelphia to take on the Eagles with their 3-5 and five record. And this was a matchup between two 3-5 and five teams that the winner of this game was going to give themselves a shot. The loser of this game was going to call it a season. And this was a win and you have a chance to get in type of scenario. Lose and you're out. The Philadelphia Eagles, it's a lot going on there. That's a very convoluted situation. I'm not even going to try to figure that one out. I'm not going to try to break that down. It's like a, a Rubik's Cube when you just can't figure it out. I've never been able to put together a Rubik's Cube. And that's what the Philadelphia Eagles are. I don't know what's going on there. All I know is that the Cowboys came into this game. And they're a talented football team. Both of these teams are, for the most part. But the Cowboys find ways to lose games. Whereas the Eagles find themselves in situations where they're not even in ball games because of the things they do in the course of a ball game. So the Cowboys get close and then find a way to lose. Meanwhile, the Eagles find themselves out of ball games at the end because they didn't do enough during the course of the game, you know, whether it be self-destructing or just not making plays that were there, to have them out of the game at the end. Which one was going to win out? Were the Eagles going to get blown out or were the Cowboys going to lose this game at the end in a heartbreaker? The Eagles getting blown out, won out in this game. As we saw last week, the Eagles you know, made mistakes in this game, had opportunities, didn't take advantage of them. And it all kind of went downhill once Michael Vick got hurt. And you could say a lot of things that happened in this game changed the course of the game. You could even argue that the Eagles, after bringing in Nicholas Foles, now you could even argue that the Eagles had a 17-10 to 10 lead in this ball game after Nick Foles was able to connect with Jeremy Macklin on that 44-yard touchdown pass on a blown assignment by the Cowboys in that secondary. But you never really felt comfortable with the Eagles winning this game because you knew after a while Nick Foles was going to be skittish. He's a, he's a rookie. He hasn't been getting a lot of snaps. Say what you want about this Dallas Cowboys team. You know, you say what you want about this Dallas Cowboys offense. You know, lack of running game without DeMarco Murray which even in this game, Felix Jones was pretty good. I mean, this is the best I've seen Felix Jones in a long time. i got to go back to maybe his second season in the league where he was probably at his best. He looked really good in this game. He looked spry, caught the football well, he ran it well, he ran tough. This was the best of Felix Jones in this game. But say what you want about this Dallas Cowboys team, this offense, Tony Romo, inability to get it done, late game situations, Jason Garrett, his inability to make in-game adjustments and, and coach this team down the stretch. You say what you want about those guys and, and what they're doing, don't talk about this Dallas Cowboys defense because they get it done. You look at the Dallas Cowboys defense and you stack them up against the best defenses in the league, and you'll see that the Cowboys are right there. They play defense. If nothing else, this Dallas Cowboys team plays defense. And so, you know, it was only a matter of time before they got to Nick Foles and started to create havoc. Whether it be sack him, make him flustered in the pocket, have him looking over his shoulder, is someone coming, or force him into the big mistake. And you know it was coming. He had a pick six called back. He threw it right to him. And this was a terrible decision. I don't even know what the rationale here was. Think pre-snap, he had already decided, whatever the situation is, whatever the coverage is, I don't care. I'm swinging this one out in the flats to LaShawn McCoy. I don't care who's over there. I don't care what is going on around me. I'm throwing the ball in the flats. That's where it's supposed to go. That's where I'm going with it. And without even looking, just blind faith, he just throws it over there. And Anthony Spencer is right there. He picks it off. He runs in the end zone. Luckily enough for him, 
that was holding on that play. Claiborne, the corner, the rookie corner um, out of LSU for the Cowboys, was called for holding on that play, which eh, is a little bit of, you know, a little, little debatable. However, it was called. He got lucky. He caught a break. But you knew. It's only a matter of time before someone jumped up and bit him. And wouldn't you know, later on in the game, Deshaun Jackson has one go off his hands. All game long, Nick Foles had been throwing behind open receivers, whether it's a slant, a post, out, whatever. He was throwing behind guys. He was a step late, and I think that speaks to the speed of the game. In college, that was right on money. In the NFL, that's a step late. You have to anticipate, and guys are faster. Deshaun Jackson is faster than any guy you play with at Arizona. So you have to anticipate that. This goes to him not practicing with these guys. This is more along the lines of him not taking any snaps with the first-team offense. He's not used to the game speed. So everything was behind. So it goes off of Deshaun Jackson's hands, caroms off of another Dallas Cowboy player, right into the waiting arms of Brandon Carr, who picks it off, takes it to the house. And that really sealed the game before that happened. The Cowboys... Had Dwayne Harris return a punt for a touchdown, the Cowboys have had have not had success returning punts this season. And in fact, Dwayne Harris was back there because Des Bryant couldn't secure that job because he kept dropping the football and fumbling and muffing punts. So Dwayne Harris takes it down the sideline. And punters in this league make me sick. You don't ask a lot out of punters. You just ask them to do three things. Hold the ball on field goal attempts. Punt the football and tackle somebody if they come in your direction. Or at least get in the way. That's all you ask out of a punter on any given NFL roster. Tackle someone if they come your way. Punt the football. Hold the ball on field goal attempts. That's it. Not asking anything else out of you. 93% of the punters in the league can't do one of those things. They can do the punting thing well. That's what they do. They can hold the football, that's not a problem, but they can't tackle someone or at least get in the way when called upon. And that's what Matt McBride did in this game. He did absolutely nothing. It, Dwayne Harris is literally six inches away from out of bounds. A slight shove would have probably pushed him out of bounds. All Matt McBride had to do was either one of three things. One or A, jack that defender up into Mr. Harris, knocking him out of bounds or forcing him inside. B, take such an egregious angle outside, hell, run out of bounds if you have to, to force Mr. Harris back inside, which would have taken him right to the help. Eagles had guys coming off the pace. Or C, push him out of bounds yourself. Just take one arm that's not being held up by that, that blocker and push him out of bounds. He chose option D. None of the above. Nothing. And let him run right down the sideline. All he had to do was fall down. Even if he got a 15-yard penalty for leg whip or, you know, going low, cut block, whatever. If Dwayne Harris gets tackled and the Eagles defense gets to come on the field, you never know what happens. You don't know if Romo makes a boneheaded decision. They fumble the snap. They miss a field. You don't know what happens. You give your defense a chance to get a stop. Instead, you do nothing. He runs for a touchdown. You ultimately lose the game. Punters, I tell you, can't live with him. Can't live without him. So, the Eagles ultimately lose in this football game, 38-23, to and... They gave it a value effort. You lose your starting quarterback. You get a rookie in there. You know, these things happen. I don't think they were going to win this game. And I, it's hard for me to say they weren't going to win anyway. It just didn't feel, it didn't feel like an Eagles win. That first possession was gorgeous. They did nothing after that with Vic in the game. So it's hard for me to kind of say, yeah, they were going to do this and do that without, you know, with Vic in the game. Hard to say. It doesn't matter. What happened, happened. The Cowboys get it done. They go to 4-5 and five on the season, save their season. Meanwhile, the Eagles join the Redskins in the cellar of the NFC East. Come on down. It's a little dark. It's a little cold. But you'll get used to it once you get down here. Always nice to have company. Misery loves company. Come on down in the cellar with us 
in the bottom of the NFC East at 3-6. and six. You look at the St. Louis Rams taking on the San Francisco 49ers in a matchup that, frankly, I was this close to making my sole survivor pick. But I said, nah, I don't want to waste that pick this early on my 49ers selection. I don't want to do that. And they have this same Rams team later on in the season. Worst case scenario, just use it then. Even though it's on the road, even though it's family business, the 49ers are the better team. They're going to win this game going away. And maybe later on in the season, I'll decide to use them at some point. I don't know. So I didn't want to use my 49ers. So I said, if you wanted to, go right ahead. Be my guest. I'd sign off on it. But I had a better Soul Survivor pick. But those of you who decided that this was your best option, <laughs> sucks to be you on this Monday afternoon because you didn't get it done. You got a tie. Now, don't know what that means in the grand scheme of a survivor pool, but I know it's not a win. And in most instances, a tie is like a loss. So I'm pretty sure in your survivor pool today, that tie means you didn't win, which means you're eliminated. So again, stick with me and I'll take you to the promised land. You veer off on your own and go in your own direction at your own risk. Buyer beware. That's all I can say to you. But in this football game, the Rams came out, and what a difference Danny and Mandola makes. I mean, he changes the whole perception of this team. I got a man, a friend of mine, my barber that cuts my hair. He's a Rams fan. There's not many of these guys out there. Not a lot of guys out there that like the Rams. But I'm talking to him. I, I, I walk into the shop, and as I walk into the shop, he says, hey, you got those Rams this week? I'm like, no. He's like, Danny and Mandola back. I said, and? And Danny Amendola is the man. That's what that and means. Danny Amendola came back and the, what my barber was talking about is exactly what happened in this game. Danny Amendola makes a difference. We already knew that, but I didn't know it meant that much to this offense on that grand of a scale. I mean, you look at what Danny Amendola did for the, We're talking about a team before their bye week that was only able to score seven points against the New England Patriots in London. Seven points against a Patriots defense that stacking up against the San Francisco 49ers defense doesn't even come close. They they pale in comparison to this 49ers defense. And yet, Danny Amendola returns and this St. Louis Rams offense is on fire. I mean, 49ers were struggling. They jump out to a 7 nothing lead and you, you dismiss that. Okay, they got a lucky touchdown. Whatever happened, whether, you know, Alex Smith threw an interception, he fumbled, or Frank Gore fumbled, or Ted Ginn Jr. fumbled, or you wanted to blame it on anything but the D. <laughs> you see how I just named seven different reasons, none of them on the defensive side? You wanted to have a reason why they scored a touchdown. It wasn't on defense. Yeah, whatever. So they show the game break, and it's on defense. They scored on offense. It's a defensive blunder by the 49ers. Hmm. Okay. Whatever. So you keep going and you're saying, okay, that's not going to last. Then you look up and the score is 14 to nothing. And now you're like, mm, wait a minute. <laughs> Something's going on fishy out in the Bay Area. What's going on out there? Somebody talk to me. You get a bye week if you're the 49ers. You get to kind of take a step back and take everything you've been able to do this season all in and kind of say, all right, these are our goals for the second half of the season, none of which involve losing to the St. Louis Rams at home. So you're thinking, what's going on? They score a touchdown due to the 49ers. They, they kind of settle everything down. They climb back in the ballgame, and they just say, okay, they get even with this Rams team, they're leaving. You're even, you're leaving. So I said, okay, they caught up with them. Now they're going to pass them, and now this game is going to be put in its proper place. The Rams are going to lose by double digits. This isn't going to be close. And we're going to forget that they even had a 14-0 lead in this game. Ah, you're wrong. The Rams said, we're not going away. As a matter of fact, we probably should win this game. And that's what they set out to do. You know, both teams had opportunities to win this game in regulation. Neither one took advantage of it. So we go to overtime. The Rams in overtime... First play out of the box, 80 yards to Danny Amendola. 
you know, down to the, the 49ers six yard line. I'm like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. What is happening here? Ah, in typical bad team fashion, you get a procedure penalty. Nothing that had to do with the actual play itself, but something as simple as lining up and covering up a tackle on the end of the line. That's what bad teams do. They call back 80-yard plays that can set them up for a win against a team that they probably shouldn't beat because of a procedure penalty. That's what bad. That's what three and six teams do. That's what the Redskins, that's what the Jaguars, and you know all these three, two, one win teams, that's what they do. Bad teams find ways to have things go in the opposite direction of which they're trying to have them go. Because they're not a good football team. Bad teams self-destruct in the most inopportune times, which is what the Rams did. So now that play gets called back. You're thinking that that's your death omen right there. That is it for you. You had your chance. You blew it. 49ers get the ball. They drive it all the way down. And David Akers is in position for about a 33-yard field goal. That's normally good night. Everybody drive home safely. Except David Akers missed. Hmm. Okay, well, well he'll, he'll make it next time. Except there'll be no next time. That Rams defense was playing. Chris Long gets a sack. And I forgot to mention, even though it really didn't make that much of a difference in this game, Alex Smith, Colin Kaepernick. Alex Smith got hurt. He got a concussion in this game. Didn't really play in the second half of this game. Didn't play at all in the fourth quarter. And Colin Kaepernick came in. He was okay. He was steady. I had a buddy of mine talking about, hey, Colin Kaepernick looked good. I saw him running a lot. I didn't see him making decisions to throw the football. I seen him running and using his legs, which is okay. I mean, he put his team in a position to win. You know, David Akers normally converts a 33-yard field goal, but it didn't happen. He didn't win. Hence, we have ourselves our first tie in about two or three seasons, probably since that Donovan McNabb, I didn't know, overtime rules fiasco. Uh, don't you hate ties? Don't you just hate ties? Don't you just hate having to have that extra number at the end? I know I'm going to hate saying, and the 49ers are now 8-2-1 on the season, or 7-2-1, or 10-2-1. I'm going to hate saying that for the remainder of the season. Don't you hate looking on the screen at the graphic that has all the teams, and then they have to make the graphic just a wee bit smaller because that extra one's at the end? Don't you just hate that? Now you have to deal with it for the rest of the season because the 49ers couldn't get it done and the Rams couldn't get it done. Now we have to deal with that extra one at the end. As these two teams in the division, family business, couldn't decide their differences. You know what this was like? This was like an argument that had no winner. You guys couldn't even agree to disagree. You know, both of you guys just kept arguing to the point where you just got tired of arguing and you just both walked away. No one got their point across. No one finished their thought. This was just an open-ended conversation that just ended. And so we're just left with, hmm, a tie, huh? Yeah, a tie. 24-24, family business goes unresolved in this case. They'll have to finish it up in St. Louis later on in the season as these two teams just couldn't agree to disagree on this one. So you get a 24-24 tie. The San Francisco 49ers are now 7-2-1 and one on the season. Meanwhile, the San Francisco 49ers are now 6-2-1 and one on the season. Meanwhile, the St. Louis Rams are 3-5-1 and one on the season. And look, now the Seattle Seahawks are climbing back into it. 49ers keep messing around, keep messing around. They're going to give this Seattle Seahawks team false hope. And remember... The 49ers still have to travel to CenturyLink, a place where the Seahawks have not lost all season long. So we move on to what was supposed to be this grand finale of Sunday in Week 10 in the National Football League. This, you know, huge game between two mammoth football teams, you know, two juggernauts from each conference, you know, teams that could ultimately represent their conference in the Super Bowl in February. Who knows? We're talking about two 7-1 teams, 7-1 Chicago Bears at home, at Soldier Field, hosting the 7-1 Houston Texans. It was supposed to be a 
clash of epic proportions. Not quite. What I've learned in this season that I really didn't pay much attention to before, but I've seen it time and time again this season, which I can no longer ignore, is the fact that when teams get inclement weather and they weren't prepared for it, you can know it's coming, but they're actually playing it. When teams get inclement weather and they're not prepared for it, you get some really sloppy, lousy football. We saw it with the Cleveland Browns and the San Diego Chargers, 7-6. to six. We saw it. Hell, hell, we just saw it a couple weeks ago on Monday Night Football with the Bears and the Lions. You know, slick football. Teams that aren't prepared to play in inclement weather. You get bad football sometimes. And this was supposed to be a game when we figured some things out. We figured some things out. We figured out nothing in this game. This, this game was a lot of nothing. I was so disappointed. This was a dud. This is one of those games you went to sleep on and you woke up. Who won? Oh, okay. And you went back to sleep. This was so disappointing on so many different levels because I was supposed to figure out, you were supposed to figure out, the whole league was supposed to figure out who are the Chicago Bears? What is this offense made of? Who are the Houston Texans? Can they take their show on the road? All we figured out was that the Houston Texans game is better suited for the rain than the Chicago Bears game is. And we already knew that. Because the Houston Texans run the football, play good defense, play action fake off of the run. All things that are okay to do in the rain. So we already knew that. We already knew the Houston Texans team, not just their offense, their team is better suited for rain and inclement weather. We already knew that. That's all we found out in the game. The obvious. This game just stated the obvious. We don't know which team is better. We don't know what's what. We don't know if the Bears can score on offense without the help of their defense. We don't know anything. We have nothing to take away from this game other than the Texans play better football in the rain than the Chicago Bears. Oh, and by the way, Jay Cutler suffered a concussion in this game. And they had to go the rest of the game without Jay Cutler's services. The whole second half had to put Jason Campbell in. And he wasn't able to get it done. But again, sloppy football game. The Bears had about 19 turnovers. You can't win like that. But it, again, inclement weather does that to you. We found nothing out in this game. Very disappointing. Texans get it done. 13-7. Take their record to 8-1 and on the season. Bears drop to 7-2. and We didn't learn anything in this game. All we learned was that the Houston Texans are suited to play in the rain. Who didn't already know that? Raise your hand. Any hands? Any hands out there? I didn't think so. Everybody already knew running the ball with Arian Foster, doing play action fake, playing sound defense, it's going to win you some games in the rain. That's what the Texans do. That's what they were able to do against the Bears. They got it done. So that's the Sunday slate of games. That's a touchdown. Throw it up. We'll attack on these quick extra points. I'm going for two. Going for two on this one. Got my prediction ready for you on Monday Night Football. We'll get to that really quick. Pittsburgh Steelers, Kansas City Chiefs, Steelers playing good football, Steelers at home, Chiefs on the road, Chiefs bad football team, Pittsburgh Steelers win. Really simple. Not going to get into the X's and O's and why this is, why that. Gun. Steelers are going to win at home because they're playing the Chiefs. If you want to win a game in the National Football League, just call up the Chiefs, schedule them for a game, you'll get yourself a W. That's what the Steelers have on the horizon tonight. But I caution you, as strange as things have went this weekend, wouldn't be surprised if this game was a lot closer than we all thought, but it's the Chiefs, man. Really? Steelers win this one easy. So, moving right along, what I really want to get to, why this is a two-point conversion. Oh, and in case you just needed a prediction, Chiefs, mm, I, I had the game 26 to 6. But in the spirit of how this weekend went, Chiefs 9. <laughs> Chiefs 9, still is 23. Not 26 to 6, 23 to 9. So, what I really wanted to talk about in this two-point conversion was the, the benching of Reggie Bush by the Dolphins. Joe Philbin 
looking to make a statement by benching Reggie Bush. It was a it was a crucial fumble in the game. I will admit that. Crucial fumble. Can't have it. But that's not the answer in this situation. First and foremost, let, let's just get this out of the way. The Dolphins are a team void of playmakers. Void of elite talent. So you're telling me you take the most viable option as a playmaker. The most elite talent you have on the offensive end. And you sit him down because of one fumble? Now let's see. Does Reggie Bush have six fumbles on the season? Does Reggie Bush have five fumbles on the season? Does Reggie Bush have four fumbles on the season? Does Reggie Bush even have three fumbles on the season? No. Reggie Bush just has two on the season. Which leads me to pose the question, why are you benching your best offensive threat? Yeah, it was a crucial fumble in the game. Nonetheless, he's your best option at winning at the running back position. Have you gone mad? Willis McGahee has been fumbling up and down every NFL field he's set foot on this season. Do you see the Broncos making a rash decision to bench him? Now, granted, he has Peyton Manning at quarterback. You have a rookie in Ryan Tannehill. I get it. Still, you can't bench your best option at the running back position. Yeah, Daniel Thomas is nice. He's nice. He's not great. He's not going to make a play. I've seen several instances in this game where Daniel Thomas either caught a screen or he ran a football in a gaping hole where I said, that play is blocked to get 15. Reggie Bush might get you 35. Reggie Bush might get you 65 on that play and a touchdown. In a game where you desperately needed a boost, you needed anything you could get. You didn't score a touchdown in this game. Who knows? I seen a screen pass. It was blocked for 17 yards. Daniel Thomas got 17 yards. Reggie Bush might get you 47 yards. Reggie Bush might get you 87 yards and a touchdown on that play. You don't know because you didn't leave Reggie Bush in the game to see if he could. If I'm one of those leaders, and remember back to Hard Knocks when the Dolphins had that little leadership group where it was Reggie Bush, Jake Long, Carlos Dansby, all those guys, Matt Moore, you sprinkling in some other guys. And they had a sit-down meeting with Joe Philbin, and they were like the uh, sort of the buffer between the team and Joe Philbin to kind of have a voice for the team. If I'm that group, minus Reggie Bush, I'm marching right up to Joe Philbin, and I'm asking him. And I know this is your coach. He makes the executive decisions in terms of what goes on on the field. But I want to know, what was your rationale for benching the best player we have on offense? Can you, ex can you explain that to me, please, coach? Of not giving us the best option to win. Because if you're trying to send a message. The message I got. Wasn't the message that you were trying to send across. The message that you were trying to send across. Was that this won't be tolerated. We're going to be a disciplined football team. That doesn't shoot ourselves in the foot. We're going to be more detail oriented. And we're going to not turn the football over. That was the message you were trying to push across. I get that. You wanted to push that message across. The message, if I'm on that field, the message that was received was that you didn't want to win the football game. That's the message I got. That you want your ego to win out more so than the team win this football game. Because you're trying to send a message at a time when a message doesn't need to be sent. We all know that turnovers aren't the best thing for this football team. We all know we can't fumble. We can't throw interceptions. We all know these things, yet people make mistakes. I had a buddy of mine bring up a good point. Richie Incognito is your guard. You know, going into the season with Richie Incognito as your guard, you're going to get four to six personal foul penalties off the top. Starting out at the beginning of the season, you can pencil that in your book. Four to six personal foul penalties for Richie Incognito. Do you sit Richie Incognito down? No. You know why you don't sit him down? He's your best option at guard. So why do you do that with Reggie Bush? He only fumbled twice this season. Not to say Reggie has 16 fumbles. Not to say Reggie has six on this season. I've seen guys do much more than that and not get benched. And you want to bench your best player? A team void of playmakers? Where's your speed on this team? Where's your speed at the running back position? Where's your playmakers on this team? Where's your playmakers at the running back position? 
You don't have any outside of Reggie Bush. So you try to put in Lamar Miller, what's he going to do? There's a reason why Lamar Miller has not been playing this season. You know why? Because you don't trust Lamar Miller. Because Lamar Miller doesn't make any plays. Yeah, he has some speed. But it doesn't translate because he's not making any plays. That was stupid. And you deserve to get drubbed at home because of it. Not saying that you playing Reggie Bush or you benching him was ultimately the deciding factor and you losing by 34 points at home. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is you, you lessen the chances of your team winning on Sunday by benching Reggie Bush. And I thought that was the dumbest thing in a season where you've made a lot of right moves, pushed a lot of right buttons. You pushed the wrong button there. And that was the first time I actually said Joe Philbin doesn't get it as a head coach. You outthought yourself there. You thought you were doing something for the better of the team. Instead, it was a detriment to your team on Sunday. And I hope that you take a step back and realize that probably wasn't the smart thing. It probably wasn't the right thing to do. You want to reprimand Reggie Bush? Do it in practice. You want to find him? Find him. Do something. Don't hurt the rest of your football team because you want to send a message that isn't getting across. Reggie Bush might have got the message. Hell, he didn't play the rest of the first half. But what does that say to the rest of your team? Hell, if I'm on the team now, I'm afraid to make a mistake. And being afraid to make a mistake means you're playing scared. Hell, I'm scared to fumble the football as a receiver. I'm scared to fight for extra yards because if I fumble, coach might not give me the ball all game long. That's the wrong message to send to your team. Shame on you, Joe Philbin. You deserve to get your butt spanked at home 37-3 because of dumb decisions like the one you made benching Reggie Bush. And that's going to do it for this episode of In the Lab Room. I thank you for joining me. As always, Monday is a long episode, a lot to get to. We got to all of it. So, again, thank you for hanging in there with me. Also, uh, several ways to access the show, whether you're watching it, you're leaving me a message, whatever. First, there's Facebook. Like me on Facebook. The Facebook page is In the Lab Room. Like the page. Every video I've ever done on the Facebook page, check it out. Like it. Also, there's Twitter. At In the Lab Room is the Twitter handle. Every video I've ever done on Twitter. You want to talk to me? You want to interact with me? Twitter is the way to do it. I'll see the message. I'll respond. Love to hear from you. Either one of those ways. Leave me a message on Facebook. I'll get to you on that as well. Love to hear from you guys. Also, drop something in the inbox. That's the easiest way outside of the next way to get to me. It's through the inbox because... You drop something in the email, I'm getting it directly. And whether it's my phone or I'm on the computer, I'm going to see it. And I'm going to respond to you immediately. So in the lab room at gmail.com is the inbox. Drop something in it. I'd love to hear from you. And the easiest, the absolute easiest way to access the show, have every episode at your fingertips, at your disposal, is to subscribe to the YouTube page. I can't do any of these videos without the aid of YouTube. I have to go through YouTube. So if you subscribe to the YouTube page, you too will see these videos as they show up online. And so the best way to go about it is to subscribe to the YouTube page, Louis T, L-O-U-I-E, capital T-E-E, -E, is the page, Louis T. Subscribe to the page. Check it out. Every video I've ever done, from the beginning to now is on that page. And again, if you see a video, you have a comment from that video, drop it right at the bottom where the comments are made. I'll see the comment. It comes straight to the email. I'll respond to you. And it's that simple. I thank you for joining me on this Monday. Again, see you back here on Tuesday. We'll go over the Monday night matchup. We'll talk about the record for the week and how wacky it was. Then we'll start to get into things that we need to address moving forward. And uh, we'll continue on on our trek in this NFL season as we begin to embark on week 11 of this season. I thank you for joining me. want to see you back here. Same time, same place. And as always, you enjoy your day. Enjoy the football tonight. See you back here tomorrow. Have a good one.